Delighted to be here and welcome everyone. Please do continue the discussion either during this talk and afterwards and throughout. So I have put my contact details in the chat and look forward to connecting and to exchanging, but particularly to learning because as Steve has kindly introduced, this is a new area. Interestingly, being a new area, despite the fact that we've been dealing with animals for the whole time of humanity, but we've a long way to go for action, for policy, and of course, as mentioned, for legislation. So I will just to inform you, I will not be using slides during this presentation. I have a few websites that I'll share, but again, more about a conversation and exchanging ideas to hopefully learn from you and take your perspectives. Again, the title, Can Nature Take the Naturalness Out of Natural Disasters? And I've just put that uh, into the chat so that we can take a look at these phrases, particularly the phrase natural disaster. We hear it so commonly, it just rolls off the tongue. And yet from the beginning of contemporary disaster science and to a large degree policy and practice, People have questioned this phrase, natural disaster. Why are they natural? Yeah, okay, there may be aspects of nature because of course avalanches happen, volcanic eruptions occur, but are the disasters truly from nature or natural? And this is actually where the foundations teach us so much. So you see on the screen, the key paper from 1976, that far ago, which argued against the phrase natural disaster, i.e. taking this naturalness out of that phrase. And the reasoning is that the disaster comes from us in terms of our choices and what we do with nature. As sort of the comment in the chat says, we have a planet with so many hazards, but hazard in itself is a peculiar word. And then actually curious what's happening with the simultaneous translation, because many of the languages offered do not have a word for hazard. That's because the environment does what the environment does. Nature does what nature does. Again, like the avalanche of volcanic corruption. It is where we build. It is how we treat people. It is what we do with ourselves and others that then makes something hazardous to us and then leads to the disaster. If we had the options not to build in floodplains, then a flood becomes a natural process often needed for fertility, for the soil, and obviously for the, the river or the sea, not necessarily a disaster. Same with an earthquake. We know exactly how to construct infrastructure that will stand up in shaking, even the horrible shaking that was seen on the 6th of February, 2023, on the Turkey-Syria border, it was a known hazard earthquake zone. Earthquakes had happened there before. And yet long-term political processes of poor construction, of corruption, of siphoning funds, of simply not caring, led to a situation where people had no choice but to die as their buildings pancaked or toppled or otherwise collapsed. So we can make choices, at least those of, those of us with power and resources and opportunities, we can make choices to deal with nature, to deal with the so-called hazards, to deal with the environment, so that we and others are not harmed, so that disasters do not happen. And this, in fact, is the ethos of a book which I wrote called Disaster by Choice, which really goes through this notion that our choices turn hazards or potential hazards into the disaster. And I'm just going to put that link into the chat there, recognizing that nothing in that book is really original. I've simply brought together the science and the policy and the action going back to that 1976 paper and even before to try and bring it into sort of this idea of what choices occur to make this disaster by choice. So, if we do then want to consider what all this means for nature and for animals, we also have to critique this work which I've presented. Because in my book and in the paper and in a lot of work, it very deliberately makes disaster a human concern. It's very human-centric. 
it's not separating society and nature, but it is still it is still assuming that people and society are paramount. And of course, we heard that it's not about neglecting animals. It's saying we need to deal with animals because they are a human concern. Which then leads to this more philosophical question. Well, are disasters only a human concern for nature and animals and ecosystems? Are we worried only because they are a human concern? Or are there, are there other aspects? And to start this process during the last conference back in 2021, I presented on different categories of animals and habitats in disasters, but all in relation to people. So I put that paper, which emerged from the chat, in order to uh, sort of point out that we are considering animals, habitats, and interaction. Again, we're not separating society and nature. We are not separating culture and the environment. But it still is very human-centric. It still very much is this focus on people. This is changing. We, of course, have, well, if we consider Australia, maybe up to 80,000 years of human activity connecting with the environment and integrating it. In the contemporary era, era and particularly for this conference in terms of law and policy, we are seeing a lot of these ideals being enshrined, being codified in the approaches that we take. So when we talk about the non-human, when we talk about the more than human, we now have laws trying to make nature more than us. So a New Zealand river gained rights of so-called personhood under its domestic law. It basically gave a river the same legal protections as people. It's interesting that they call it personhood as opposed to riverhood, issue of language, again, human-centric, but the key was trying to say that certain rights are accorded to the natural entity of a river. And this is in law in New Zealand. One court in Bangladesh, in India, gave the Ganges River and the Yamuna River, which is a Ganges tributary, gave those two rivers, again, the rights of people. Now, it's fine for one court in India to do that. The Ganges flows into Bangladesh. So where India enacts a law or tries to enact a law, what does that mean for nature, which is transboundary? Articles 10 and 71 to 74 of the Ecuadorian Constitution accord rights to ecosystems. And then the Magpie River in Quebec, there were two simultaneous local governance declarations saying that the Magpie River has the rights of personhood, has the rights of human beings. This has not been tested in court. It's not been tested in local or Quebec or Canadian court. But interestingly, again, looking at how people warp these ideas, when this happened is reported as a legal revolution to save the planet. Think about that. Can a human law for nature, a particular aspect of nature, really save the planet? Or is this more of an exaggeration? Beyond government, corporate boards are taking this idea and moving forward with it. So one company, which you will now see on the screen, said, put nature as a director of their board. So when they are making corporate board decisions, nature has a seat there and allegedly influences the decisions. How is that actually done? This is where companies are trying and they are struggling. Some have an empty chair at their board or are considering an empty chair in order to represent nature. Others will put some sort of icon of an animal, such as a picture or a stuffed animal, so at least it's in people's consciousness. And again, in this context of that company, it may be uh, others are considering having one individual, sort of a human being, but arguing from apparently nature's perspective. So yeah, they're human, but they're still kind of that jester character or that sort of character saying just inserting ideas trying to say this is what we expect, this is what we think nature would consider. Speaking of corporations, the idea of corporate personhood or the so-called metaphysical persons has a legal basis in the US dating back to 1886. Corporations 
with personhood rights. It's actually encapsulated in the contemporary meme, I'll believe corporations are people when Texas executes one. Or in the news today, speaking of execution, it's obviously Singapore. If drugs are floated down a river, would Singapore try to execute that river? Or would we simply believe that forests are people when Singapore tries to execute a forest? These are the philosophical challenges which emerge when we do try to connect with nature and really bring nature into these human-centric constructs. So what does it mean for disasters? Well, that's sort of the question. I mean, really, what does it even mean for nature? We separate, as alluded to earlier, nature culture, environment society, wildlife, wild animals, and others. But these delineations, they cannot be strictly determined. Again, nature culture are inextricably linked. Environment, society, we cannot separate them. Even at the individual level, animals retain instincts and behaviors irrespective of how so-called domesticated they are. Not all wild animals are necessarily wildlife. And not all unowned animals are necessarily wild. In Istanbul, Dogs and cats wander around looking for food. They are unowned, yet they're part of the local neighborhoods, and they have various levels of friendliness towards people. So I came across this beauty as I was wandering around Istanbul, and the cat was absolutely interested in me until it realized I had no food, and then it wasn't interested in me. Is this a wild animal? Is it domesticated? Something in between? And who is going to take care of this cute little feline when Istanbul is absolutely devastated by a major earthquake. Could wildlife or nature be damaged, be harmed in the negative connotation by an environmental process or phenomenon? If that cat is killed during the Istanbul earthquake, is this just a natural process? Or should be actively seeking to avert that sort of feline death. After all, extinctions, including mass extinctions, are part of nature. We would not be here if it weren't for previous mass extinctions, but they do upend the environment. They do create, to use a contemporary buzzword, transformation or transformational change at the global level. Is a mass extinction a disaster? Today, if an environmental process or phenomenon might end up making a species extinct or might destroy unique habitat, then we absolutely think of it as a disaster. This happened during fires on Kangaroo Island on the south, the south coast of Australia. A fire started by lightning, damaged a highly unique habitat and endangered a species already threatened. But part of that is because humans had changed the landscape. So we were already stressing nature a natural phenomenon of a lightning-induced fire then perhaps brings it to the edge of extinction. And suddenly we're saying, well, this is, a, this, is a, this is a disaster. But again, what's a disaster? Was it the lightning? Was it the fire? Or was it the fact that we caused the stress in the first place? Thinking about this whole point of nature not causing disasters or being no natural disasters. So when society is not directly or indirectly impacted, what is the meaning of disaster? Does nature really care or worry? Some other inputs into answering this question come from various diverse scientific fields. Some studies suggest that dogs will seek help during an emergency which blurs the line that a disaster must necessarily involve people or human society. But think about this, dogs seek help in an emergency. What does emergency mean to a dog? That Istanbul earthquake, the dog may realize that something quite severe and serious has happened. Is it an emergency for it? It's still going to forge for food as it did before. It's still going to live its life between domesticity and wildness as it did before, how much difference to that dog or the cat that I showed, how much difference does it make whether the buildings in Istanbul are standing or are rubble? 
we do know that animals realize loss. Animals recognize grief. And this is well established in a lot of scientific work through books, through scientific papers from the field of animal studies. So they can recognize an emergency. They do have these emotions. Does this mean that there can be disasters for animals? Particularly when there is widespread impacts on habitats. How do we compare this to animals or nature harming humans? We know that elephants trample people on their crops, of course, lions kill, and then insect-borne diseases, tick-borne diseases are absolutely devastating for humanity in the toll of millions a year. These are disasters. Even sort of what I'm experiencing now with absolutely severe allergies from pollen, that is nature impacting me in a potentially disastrous manner. And particularly it is widespread within London where I am and elsewhere. So this is nature impacting people for some form of disasters. And nature then also impacts nature. Elephants trample people, elephants trample other animals. Lions kill people, lions kill zebras. Insect-borne disease is prevalent across animals as well. So if malaria is a disaster for us, are animals killed by mosquito-borne disease also a disaster? If so, and if we do accept the rights-based premise that humans have a right to avoid harm, humans have a right to avoid disaster, then do non-human entities, do more than human entities, have the right to protection from disaster? In Quebec for that river, the declaration states the river's, quote, right to live, exist, and flow, end quote. It has a right to evolve and live naturally, again, whatever naturally means. So there are complications regarding nature, or what about the complications regarding naturally or even to live for a non-sentient being? An earthquake can lead to a landslide damming a river. Have the river's rights to live, exist, and flow been infringed? Is this a disaster afflicting the river, entailing human action to breach that dam to let the river continue to flow? And if that earthquake happened in a place where beavers build dams across rivers, so if a river already has a beaver dam, ostensibly a natural dam, and an earthquake breaches that dam, have the river's rights been infringed because the natural dam was broken? Or have the beaver's rights been infringed because the beaver naturally built the dam and it was destroyed? Is the natural dam breaking a disaster because the water then may course down and actually flood the floodplains? They're called floodplains for a reason. But anyway, the natural dam was broken by natural process leading to a natural flood process. Where does human action come in? Stop the flood? Rebuild the dam? Because the river has those rights, which we are by law bound to uphold. Is this just about individuals, one beaver or one river or one cockroach or one mosquito? Well, let's see, if we don't kill mosquitoes, then we get malaria. That's a disaster. If we do kill mosquitoes, well, isn't that mosquito side? Aren't we infringing on nature's rights to have mosquitoes carrying parasites that bite us? Should we be worried about every insect and microbe? Or should we be considering beyond that to species, genus, phylum, or biome? It's all very well to give a river personhood. What is a river? Is it just the water flowing down that one course, ever-changing course? Is it the banks of the river? Is it the rainfalls of the entire watershed? Why simply an entity like a river or a forest rather than characteristics? The main characteristic in nature, which we seem to value, is called diversity. Biodiversity is a buzzword. There's also ecodiversity and geodiversity. Do those characteristics quantified or even looking at the quantifiable rate of change of biodiversity, ecodiversity, geodiversity, 
Should those characteristics have right? Should those characteristics be protected and have personhood as much as the river or the forest? What has rights within nature? What rights are being infringed when there's a major environmental change, such as a lightning strike, which we then turn around from a human-centric perspective and label it as a disaster? Look, we know that the idea of nature is static and not changing. That is complete nonsense. We know that. Environmental processes and phenomena are typical, even the huge earthquake, even the lightning strike. And yeah, they are sometimes hazardous to human beings. This is the whole point. If we don't act, we have problems with lightning and earthquakes. When we force people to be poor or marginalized, when we remove education or knowledge from people, they die in disasters. And that's our fault. Disaster by choice, disasters are not natural. But should we educate a beaver? Should we educate a river? Should we educate a mosquito? Who judges whether typical environmental changes, a tsunami, a storm, who judges whether these are positive or negative, and in what context and for whom? We do highlight rights. They are enshrined in law. And I certainly support human rights. I certainly support my rights to certain aspects, but I support beyond that. I not only have rights, I also have duties, obligations, and responsibilities. And some of those are quite rightly enshrined in law. When we accord the rights to personhood for a river, should we not also codify the responsibilities, obligations, and duties of that river. And if that river causes problems, should that river be punished? Like I said, maybe Singapore wants to execute a river for transporting drugs down it. Because after all, if humans put the drugs on that river, that river has a duty to try and stop the drugs transporting down it. In the same way, that a beaver dam may be natural, and if a natural process breaches that dam, never mind the responsibilities of humans to respond or not, what are the responsibilities of the river to respond or not? I mentioned mass extinctions. Nature produces them. Some of them come from the, on Earth. So there's a type of sort of volcanic eruption called a flood basalt, whereby the earth can simply rupture and we get masses and masses of lava coming through. It can be hundreds of meters high, covering an area the size of India, obviously knocks out nature to a large extent and changes the world climate, has potentially been implicated in mass extinctions, including possibly the dinosaurs, although again, it's sort of a debate about whether there were multiple triggers for that uh, or just one. Other on earth, uh, sort of mass extinction possibilities are ice ages, certainly controlled by off-Earth processes such as the Earth's orbit changing, but very much the ice rises and falls on the Earth. And also the Earth's magnetic field has this horrible habit of suddenly flipping. Think how many animals rely on the Earth's magnetic field. Think of the devastation they experience when suddenly everything changes and this happens sort of on the order of million, millions of years, but some minor flips can happen in the order of tens of thousands of years. So this is a natural process which causes disastrous impacts for animals relying, it, relying on it. And of course, and the other idea about how the dinosaurs might have gone, gone extinct was uh, an object from space impacting the Earth, probably an asteroid, maybe a comet. So we do have off-Earth processes leading to mass extinctions, not just the near-Earth object strike, but also the possibility of stars. If a star dies through a supernova near Earth, mass extinction, everything's gone. Some stars also release something called a gamma ray burst, highly lethal, basically non-survivable and no warning, possibly implicated in previous mass extinctions on Earth. So here we're talking absolute catastrophe for ecosystems. 
far in excess of 99% species individual genus phylum mortality. On earth and on, off earth processes, perfectly natural. Is this a natural disaster for nature? There's of course, certainly the human impact on nature too, with people referring to it as a sixth mass extinction at the moment. But even that point is contested. So people are writing about this idea of a six mass extinction event caused by us, but is it really speculation? Is it fiction or is it also fact? A mass extinction by people being a disaster, whereas a mass extinction from an asteroid or a flood basalt is not a disaster. How and why are we differentiating? Particularly given that of course us human beings, we come from nature. <laughs> We are a natural process. As mentioned, there is no separation between us and the environment. So is everything a natural disaster since we are part of nature and we're causing it? Why do we assume that some mass extinctions are acceptable and some mass extinctions are not acceptable? We have talked about these off earth forces, the supernova, the gamma ray burst, the input into ice ages, and of course, the near-Earth object strike. When we talk about nature, there's a whole universe out there which is natural, and some of it we haven't actually tried to destroy yet. I think that's impressive for humanity, no? We've only wrecked one planet. They sort of say, you know, Earth first, we can destroy all the other planets later. When we're thinking beyond Earth, Jupiter's moon Io has volcanoes. Other bodies within our solar system have methane or ethane floods. Mars has massive dust storms lasting days. And Venus and Mercury, basically the whole planet is a hazard, at least a hazard for humans, given the climate there, given the environment there. I mean, this is the norm. So what's the big issue? What happens on Venus, that is nature. What happens on Mars and Mercury, even in the atmosphere of Jupiter, that is nature. It's not natural for us as human beings. We would obviously struggle to survive. Does that mean that the whole planets of Venus, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, they are disasters for human beings? Or is it simply that we have to recognize that hazard, hazardousness is a phenomenon that really comes to us being entirely human-centric? So, Disasters are not natural, at least from the standard perspective of disaster research. They're this long-term societal process by which we put ourselves in harm's way, whether it's landing on Mars knowing dust storms happen or forcing poor people to live in a tsunami inundation zone. If we accept that these planetary-wide hazardous events and processes are in effect natural disasters because there's no warning, there's no way to reduce vulnerability, we're all gone. If they are natural disasters and we can do nothing about them, what does this mean for nature? What does this mean for disaster as a long-term social process? Well, for public policy, I mean, what, what can we really do except simply raise them such as in this forum and hopefully the continuing discussion. Uh, as per the chat, please do put your questions, raise them. Um, and I can respond to them or I'll finish shortly and then we can discuss. Because for public policy, often our leaders are not considering what we as academics and pro-academics are thinking about. So at least put the ideas out there as we're doing. With legal personhood, with corporate boards, with all these other issues, how do we act on them? What does it really mean for disasters? Well, there is not a lot of work on dealing with disasters off planet. We are doing some. We do have a research group and one paper on this topic I can say more if useful, but we do find a lot of misguided approaches in public policy by focusing on apparent hazards which are not existential but calling them existential and not focusing on the real existential ones. The two main ones which are assumed to be existential but are not really are climate change and near earth object strike. So look, human caused climate change is happening undoubtable, we are doing it, it is terrifying with huge implications. Despite a lot of examination, 
I've yet to find a specific human-caused climate change scenario which causes the extinction of human beings. So a lot of difficulties, yes, but not an existential threat. What's really interesting is I can't even find a scenario where we change the climate in the globe more than it has in the past. I mean, we can take particularly the Eocene epoch, which was around 53 to 49 million years ago, where atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations were four to six times the value today, and mean global temperature was 10 to 18 degrees warmer than in the late 19th century. What did the planet care? It was no big deal. Ecosystems were thriving. Animals were thriving. The difference, of course, is us. We couldn't survive that. It would be absolutely catastrophic for us, again, human-centric, which separates humanity from nature. So what is the disaster? Ice ages have happened in the past. They brought over one kilometer thick ice sheets down to the mid-latitudes. They're going to happen again. What do we do with Toronto? Do we just move the city or do we somehow manage to live with one kilometer thick ice sheets right in that area? A city of 3 million people, a whole urban conurbation of 6 million people. So is that a natural disaster? Do we blame ourselves for building a city at 45 degrees latitude north? These are the questions when we interact with nature as we always do. Certainly during the ice ages, sea levels ended up 120 meters lower than today, 120 meters. And yet some we were seem to be worried because of two to four meters of sea level rise compared to 120 meters of sea level fall. fall. Well, we've a right to be worried because we've built mega cities in the inundation zone of two to four meters above current sea levels. It's us. We have created the disaster, irrespective of what nature is doing. And yeah, as with near-Earth objects, we can manage that. We have plenty of techniques to deflect an object, to nudge it out the way, provided we have enough warning. All we need to do is monitor the skies and be ready. But of course, we're not monitoring the skies and we're not ready. So any disaster is us. It's our disaster by choice. In the meantime, what do we do about the real existential threats like the supernova, like the magnetic field flipping, like the gamma ray burst, like the flood basalt? Can and should we do anything? Even if we legislate, are we going to legislate against a flood basalt? Because all laws are human created. Well, apart from nature's laws, like the laws of physics. So even the word law tangles us up in a mess due to the different meanings. What is the meaning of rights? What is the meaning of disaster? Now, some of this may seem to be deviating from animals in nature, particularly sort of in today's populist term being AI. Oh, I'm talking about animals. This is artificial intelligence, not artificial insemination. And whether or not artificial intelligence, robots, androids should also have rights. Science fiction has dealt with this for decades, as has science. Think how many ecosystems are artificial and constructed from English hedgerow hedgerows to engineered rivers. But yet apparently some of these should have rights because they're nature. While we construct other things like buildings and fossil fuel vehicles, roads, railways, should they have rights? Should they be protected from disaster because of their entities, not the human impacts? This is sort of the, the different approaches which are required. I mean, it's not just artificial ecosystems we create, but we produce genetically modified organisms in so many ways. It's been done for millennia. Yeah, there are debates on GMOs today and the fact that if we wanted, we could actually genetically engineer animals and plants to withstand everything. But selective breeding has been part of humanity, part of humanity for millennia. If we even consider, for example, the... Uh, rather bizarre creature that you see on the screen, keep in mind that this is a wolf. But it's not quite a wolf because we've done selective breeding to make it somewhat different from a wolf. We're controlling nature anyway. We are creating artificiality within nature anyway. What is the meaning and role of nature, of sentience and of life? So perhaps three major policy pathways emerge in summary. Number one is the right, the right to protection from disaster, protection from harm. But what do we do about off planet? And number two, if we have rights, what do we do about Judy's responsibilities and obligations? 
And then number three, if it is human destruction of nature in a mass way, that is termed ecocide, to try to look at mass environmental destruction in the same way as genocide. What happens about the mass destruction of people by nature? Should nature be punished? Well, <laughs> if we're not here, <laughs> even codifying it will not permit us to punish it. We can enforce the code. And is it really ecocide for environment or ecosystems, or is it diversity side? Because we're concerned about diversity. What happens about off-planet ecocide? The question that titles this talk, can nature take the naturalness out of natural disasters, to a large extent then seems entirely irrelevant. It depends entirely on how a disaster is defined and on how nature is defined and on how society is defined. And human beings, we make the definitions, disaster by choice, definition by choice. The answer to the title, to the talk's question, is then entirely what we want it to be. So please tell me, what do you want it to be? Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kalman. What a thought-provoking presentation. So many questions to think about and ask ourselves as well as our jurisdictions and organizations. It strikes me that despite all our efforts to disconnect from nature as humans have endeavored to civilize, that even more interconnected we have become in our efforts to survive as a species and to save our planet. Do you think humanity has a chance to figure out all these effects and impacts to animals and disasters? and prevent their extinction or even our own? Yes, 100%. We have the resources, we have the money, we have the knowledge. People being here, we have the interest. Not everyone has our privileges, but enough do. So if we want to, we can. There is a fundamental, do we want to stop extinctions? These extinctions are natural. Again, it's this difference between nature causing the extinctions or us being separate from nature causing the extinctions but that's entirely our choice, it's our values. So the answer is yes, if we want to. And we do have a question in the uh, Q&A. So could you expand on how we might better draw on relational interconnected communal embedded worldviews that may underlie some ideas of protection of nature and individualistic dichotomizing reductionist approaches that underlie Western legal frameworks? And would doing so help us manage any of the challenges you identify? So yes, I can expand. And if you give me about three hours or even three days, <laughs> but actually, I mean, that question is so important and it is key because I come from a particular demographic. I come from particular training and a particular viewpoint. There are many others out there. And the questioner is absolutely right. I didn't touch on uh, many ideas, many thoughts, many notions well beyond what those of us on this in this conference represent. How do we do it? Learn listen, talk to people on their terms, connecting with us partly on our terms, but really just trying to understand in different ways and in different approaches. So in the same way that some corporations are thinking about having a human being talk for nature, represent nature, of course, we're using a certain language here, a certain way of communicating, uh, and that may be required to deal with all these other worldviews and these cultures and knowledges and wisdoms, but it's always going to be that balance. What we can do is take that question, act on it, and ensure that we are doing our best to do on other people's terms while translating it, interpreting it for us, and then applying the strengths of all humanity to overcome the limitations of all humanity to try and solve, resolve the massive challenges that exist at the moment. Professor Kelman, I really appreciate your time and effort for this presentation. 